Hi, everybody. Dr. Friedman here. And I can't believe it's week three in the Austin class. We have just completed our second novel, the novel that more of my students thought they'd read in the past than actually had. It's not especially surprising that Pride and Prejudice would have a whole bunch of folks who are bringing to their initial reading a whole bunch of cultural baggage. What was fascinating to me were there were at least two students who literally had thought that they had read Pride and Prejudice before because they are so immersed um, in the what we might call the Austin Industrial Complex. So it's a good week to also talk uh, and do some initial introduction of um, dating simulators, visual novels, interactive fiction, um, and the games that are inspired um, by Austin. Um, we're going to look at a whole lot more of those after we finish reading the canonical Austin novels. Uh, for now, we looked primarily at Spiral Atlas's Incomplete Pride or Prejudice, which is a fairly linear but highly customizable in terms of sprite um, attempt at an adaptation of Pride and Prejudice, as well as Matches and Matrimony, which is described in um, Omirova's piece for Persuasions Online. What I really loved about that piece in particular was that I could say, hey, this student, this was a master student's piece that was then published in the peer-reviewed arm of the Jane Austen Society of North America, which is pretty neat to be able to show students. Uh, and of course, it cites a whole bunch of folks like my friends uh, Sarah Greenfield and Linda Troost, who have been doing work on Austin and adaptation and Austin games for a whole lot longer than I have. We spent most of class talking about Pride and Prejudice, although inevitably part of our conversation were the things that adaptations bring in. For example, canonical kisses in Pride and Prejudice. There are three of them and none of them are romantic. Um, in fact, uh, arguably they are the quite opposite of romantic. Uh, we talked about the proposal in particular as a space of the unuttered, and I compared it as I have compared um, Austin a couple of times to the work of Frances Burney, where her Evelina proposal is far more flamboyant and, and thus comedic than what Austin pulls off in that moment of revelation. Once the mood turns romantic, Austin politely pulls back away from words uttered and even actions depicted and then zooms back in when we see a glimpse of what this couple is going to be in the future uh, teasing getting along um, you know kind of figuring out more things about one another we also spent some time after the break um, you know when we were talking about games a student was like we still haven't talked about uh, Jane very much and not Eleanor either in Sense and Sensibility the previous week which was a, actually a really good moment to talk about those characters in relationship to the possibilities that open up when you turn something into a playable game and the question then became okay so if they're they became the protagonists as opposed to kind of secondary heroines what would have to change and a lot of what would change of course is questions of agency they are characters that by and large things happen to, especially Jane. And they are creature, they are um, victims of circumstance. And as I said to students, and I said this to students one billion times uh, over the last couple of weeks, this is an example of a character who has a long history in fiction before Austen. In many 18th century novels, Jane would be the heroine. Um, and it would be a story about what happens to her and her lack of agency would be entirely the point. What Austin is trying to do, and she's not the only one, but she's part of this vanguard, is trying to depict real choices and learning and the ability to learn to read human beings rightly. Um, she's not, again, the first to do that, but by framing her novel and 
most of her novels in this way, we can see how you'd have to do a lot of work with Jane. Basically, Jane would almost become, uh, you know, the Anne Elliot of uh, Persuasion. It was another thing that we talk, have started to talk about now that we have two novels under our belt and we're moving towards the full six, is showing the ways that Austen works in characters that are archetypal or are um, depictions of particular kinds of situations over and over and over again. The seduced young woman, the uh, woman who is unable to choose for herself, um, the woman with a big mouth, um, the, you know, the military man, the clergyman. But in different settings and different scenarios, we are able to see kind of alternate ways of understanding those uh, characters. So as uh, we were talking about the culpability of Lydia and her narrative, we were able to say, well, yes, in another novel, Lydia would be completely understood as being punished for her sins. It's really hard to simply do that in a narrative that tells us about Georgiana, right? Georgiana is equally a victim or potential victim. She's just able through circumstance to be rescued in a way that Lydia can't. And you can say, oh, that makes Lydia all the more culpable. But I think that as we were talking, what became very clear is, you know, it's a there but for the grace of God. And in a similar way, we can then connect back to Marianne, who could just have easily become a similar kind of victim, uh, in part because she's just enough older than Lydia, and she's just enough differently circumstanced. And her seducer is just that much more mercenary that the situation is is transformed. But what's really notable, right, is that Austin is making this enormous spectrum of representation of, circ of human circumstance and psychology out of what we know to be a pretty limited palette. So those were some of the things that were on the table in our discussion this week. Um, and what I really loved about thinking about and introducing some scholarship about Austin games at this moment, this moment where we're pretty familiar with the plot of Pride and Prejudice. So it wasn't, you know, a lot of, you know, rehearsing what, what it is we know, which we might have to do in subsequent weeks with some of the less familiar and longer novels, um, is to start to plant the seeds of narrative structure, um, the moving parts and, and the, and kind of alternate ways of representing, but also alternate ways of narrating, which a lot of games explore. We'll do this in a much bigger way, as I said, in about week eight. Um, for now, we're gearing up for two weeks of pretty intense reading. Um, and we're going to let the, the, the game conceit part of things go for just a second, because we're dealing with uh, novels that have not had direct adaptations. Pride and Prejudice has tons. Mansfield Park, not so much. Mansfield Park barely has film adaptations uh, to speak of. There are there are several, but far fewer than many of the other novels. We're going to have as one of our visitors, uh, Marcus Gonzalez. Uh, Dr. Gonzalez is a brilliant writer who has been writing for the public much longer than I have. And as I said to students, much more beautifully. I teach his work on whiteness and Jane Austen, which he wrote for Lit Hub in 2019 ever since it was published. I have found it incredibly useful even, and it, perhaps especially at this PWI, this predominantly white institution, it still works with students uh, because it is meeting them where they are, this moment of not feeling wholly comfortable in the 18th century, albeit for very, very different reasons, is a good kind of bridge for us to come together. Other big reading is the reading that transformed, I think, our collective understanding of Austin, which is Saeed's uh, work on uh, Austin and Empire. So 
those are kind of the big ideas for next week as we jump into a novel which as I said to my students who loved to make fun of Mr. Collins this week we're going to see a very different clergyman a very different representation of the clergy a very different representation of a heroine's inability to act so my I'm really excited to see what my students who love Jane do with Fanny Price who is often vilified as the least likable of Austen's heroines I have a soft spot in my heart for her maybe you do too um, but at any rate we're um, gonna be back uh, next week and uh, see you then <laughs>